like I said, I'm, I'm into this new day thing. I done showed you this. This is from this summer. I showed this this morning in the pit. Hundred, I think it was 103 degrees when I took this. 81 degrees with the, with the land covered. See, that's the one thing I think we're here when we're waiting for the snow to melt in the spring. And if we've got a lot of trash there, I think it does take a little longer for the soil to thaw out in the spring if you got that. That's the, I think that's maybe the one little drawback. So you need more biology. That's what I'm just going to say. Get more biology and you get through warmer soils in the spring. That's the big difference. Yeah. So let me put that in perspective as you think about this a minute. We got how many people here? 25? 20. Huh? 20. 20? Okay. Let's put 75 in here. Let's put 150 in here. You got to think about that. And it's exactly the same principle. The more, the more heat they put off, the more CO2 they put off, the quicker that soil will warm up. It, well, matter of fact, it will never get as cold. And that's how we can grow green up here in the winter underneath that snow. But you can't do that if you don't have the biology. And that's, that's when you see that slow warm up, because you got that blanket there, if you got the bodies working underneath there. But I'm telling you, 130 degrees, there ain't nothing working there. And if it's 130, I ain't going to be working there. Because I ain't going to work very long if I do that. And I'm going to skip through these because you done saw them. Kind of similar presentation, but I want to get out here at the end. Have you really the phosphate in the soil? Say what? Phosphate. Yeah, I, I haven't put any phosphate down in eight years. I got plenty of phosphate. I just got to convert it to, to readily available. We're going to get into that here in just a minute when I finish this about soil testing. So, this is where this one's a little different. So here we are, and Ben's like, that last slide that I had where, where we took in the rainfall and this, we decided, let's see how much I can really take in. So we got a four foot wagon wheel that we adapted for our water infiltration ring. Rain gauge, now if you notice, this pivot's not moving, because I took a sharpshooter and a, a, a pipe wrench and anchored it down, because there's a GoPro camera, you got a GoPro camera here. We put in seven inches in an hour and 38 minutes. By the way, if you can, if you can really zoom in, that rain gauge is fixing to run over at six inches right now. See anything in there that sticks out? Yeah. The water's we, all running down the hill to the neighbors. Yeah. Across <laughs> <laughs> the road with, with the other <laughs> So, seven inches, we just shut the pivot off. You see up here at the top of the screen, there's a little bit standing there, and that lasted about another uh, half a minute before it went away. It was really zooming in. The next big project is we're going to do this and just leave it turned on until we go to run water out of the field, or pond and real heavy. So we're, we're, not, we're not full yet at seven inches. And think about that. If you got a seven inch rain in an hour and 40 minutes, could you do that? I didn't say, can you do it now? Can you do it? Remember, nothing's impossible until you try. I learned so much for the team that I built working together. And like I said, we've done a lot of this pushing and pulling. And now, now I really push them. But these two soil scientists, and there's three of them now with Amy there, have really taught me a lot. And I have taught them a lot. Because they've never had anybody want to do the crazy things that I've, I've wanted to do for the years. And it wasn't all successful. But we 
we've done that, and the better photograph of that is this one. You still see some red, but look down in here, and you can see where the mixing's still happening. My goal is, and I've got about four inches of this down to the original plow pan, where it's darker. And I'm going to get there within the next two or three years. What does that really mean, though? This is the big controversial thing. The original soil survey was mapped. This soil was a used to flu in. These were a very young soil, about 500 years old along the river. Typically didn't have a very dark surface. And this field didn't have that eight years ago. This has been a, a couple of years. That was my state soil scientist. Today, I see a dark soil we call molly. So now we can now reclassify this as a fluventic half to soil. And that stirred Washington, D.C. up because they have mapped the entire country in the original soil survey. And now this idiot, Dave Brandt, is the only other producer in the United States that the NRCS has reclassified his soil. I say there's hundreds of us out there, but we just don't have the right team. What that means, this fluventic hapta soil, is it's a very dark soil. It's very aggregated. It can hold lots of water with water holding capacity. My, my soil organic matter in this field went from about four tenths of an, uh, uh, a tenth of a percent. I had a little bit of six and seven tenths in that field when I started. Now we're all above one and a half to three in a 10 year period. Soil scientists at, abroad says you can't do it that quick. And you damn sure can't change the classification of it. So much that a new team came to the farm this year and said, you can't do that. We're a soil scientist and, and headquarters sent us here to prove you wrong. And I said, really? Do you want? I got $100 in the pocket. Game <laughs> on? Oh, we're, well, I know we can't do that. And I said, most people would want to shovel and want to dig it before they go to bad mouth me. And, and he laughed, and we, we get along all right. So they went out and they extensively had surveyed the field. But that day, I, I just had him a shovel, and I said, here, bud, you go look. And he took off and went out there and started digging like, like me, like a, a badger. And my other soil scientists were standing there and said, well, are we going to go over there? So, they do his work. Not going to influence him. He dug that hole. I can see him out there. <laughs> Dig. He, and he'd walk over here. He dug four big holes. He'd come back up and he said, I'm glad I didn't bet you $100. He said, This is not I used to flu in soil. He said, Actually, you're two numbers darker than you need to be to be called a molic habit soil, fluidity habit soil. So not only am I there, I'm pushing the next realm. But what does that really mean other than aggravating America? And the big survey hadn't come back yet. So they done a water infiltration test. They brought these new meters in. It cost $5,000 a piece. They brought three of them measure around here they didn't work worth a crap because we had just done the seven inches he said well, i think he'd take in two to three inches an hour i was like we just put you just watch me but they said i know i know there's something wrong we're we'll going to have to recalibrate and so they're still working on it but what does that really mean i love pie Really good. But my mom used to brag all the time about her crust. How light and 
flaky it was. But one day I said, Mom, I don't care about the crust. I want the real stuff. So how important the soil aggregation to soil health? It's everything, beginning with the improved water infiltration, water holding capacity, carbon storage, and more nutrients. The more organic matter I build, what comes with that? Water. Carbon. Carbon. Water holding capacity. Earthworms. Earthworms. I'll tell you what, I got a license plate here. No, I can't make that deal. I had to take that out of the customs. Never mind. I was fixing to make y'all a wager. What else? What, the, what do we gripe about buying the most today? Nutrients. Kevin, every percent of organic matter that I build, what comes with that? Wait for someone to show it Nutrients. Yep, and how much? Yeah. Kevin, you got an idea? How much nutrients come with that? Every percent? Kelly? Can you just talk about water, not nutrients? Nutrients come with it. Nitrogen, phosphorus. In today's world, uh, it's, it's major. It's major. What all? Because every percent, you're gaining more. That's the reason, as we degraded the soil, what did we have to start doing? As our organic matter was up here at 8 or 10 or 12 percent, we didn't need inputs. Your granddad, did he ever buy any nitrogen? Well, well that's the way it was whenever he had a patch of new breaking. Yep. Right. If we can get an eight or ten chance of rainfall event, and we're going to have them, they just had these in, in Kentucky, and you'll have them up here someday, to somewhere. Can we take it all in, or at least most of it? Provides multiple benefits. One of them is future water to grow cover crops with. More nutrients stay in the field instead of downstream, and the soil stays in place. Now, I've changed this a little bit. We went through this a minute ago, and I stopped you at that last slide. That was Russ Jackson. Now we're in Mino, Oklahoma, and another guy named Mark Thomas, him and his wife. They're over here. It's not a very good shot. It was thunder and lightning on us. The only reason there's water here is because right behind us there's a tin horn lets the water come out of this field and over in here. This is the neighbor. So we waited till the cloud went over. We went down to, to another shot. Mark's done planted his cereal rye and triticale mix over here. These farmers were just tearing the day before getting their seed bed pre prepared. When we took water out of the bar ditch, and, and Texans will tell you they can drink out of, of the hoof print. Well, if I'm going to drink out the hoof print, which one of them is I'm going to choose? Yeah. The other one's we, more nutritious. Yeah, that's <laughs> chocolate milk. <laughs> Folks, we're going to get our tail in vice if we keep doing this. Because as population grows in the urban areas, and we get smaller out here, they're going to start demanding this. We don't want regulations. We need to do this on our own. Now, this is up in the Red River Valley. This is Michael Larson, another good friend of mine. The Red River Valley is notorious down in North Dakota, up into Canada, about abuse. Michael has only been doing this three years. Yep, there's a little water standing, a little bit in the bar ditch, but no comparison. And this neighbor tells Michael, he's as crazy as Jimmy Emmons or worse. This will never work. I 
I'm going to show you a video now of Jeremy Wilson, another good friend of mine from Jamestown, North Dakota. That's the great thing about my travels. I've met a lot of wonderful producers that I've been out in the field with and shared with. And Jeremy had a, a horrible experience last year after the big drought. And normally what happens after a big drought? We could have a big, big rainfall event. The video I'm fixing to show you is after the fact, but it rained 14.1 inches in 12 hours at Jeremy's house, and it hailed for six hours while it was raining. 14 inches. So his field should look like what? Crap. Lake. <clears throat> should be some big washes in it. Should be a lot of soil even. It's not eroding the soil away. Some of my poor residue fields. It swept his residue away. A lot of this is coming off the neighbor. Look how clear that is. You took your drink in. That field was as level the next day as it was the day before it rained, except where it swept the residue, and it did put up a few piles here and there, but it's just like residue. Now, it was horrible for the neighbors. Jeremy took in all he could take in. It's only going to hold so much, and it depends on the capacity, and that, and that, that varies. But the, but the point is, What's leaving is not soil, it's not nutrients, it's just as clean as water. Then we don't have issues to, to battle. And that's, that's from, I've seen this everywhere I've been. The amazing things that, that we can do. Now, resiliency, and then we're going to talk about soil testing. I haven't forgotten. This is from the summer right now. This is my grain sorghum. And it's not going ahead. It, this, I took this about three weeks ago. This is the neighbors across the road. I planted both fields. High inputs and tillage. No inputs. Good soil health. The resiliency you can, you can build in the system. Now, if it never rains, it's really not going to matter. But my bet it's going to rain when we need it. We'll need it. This is Michael Thompson up in northwest Kansas. Michael on the left. Neighbors here. See in the background up there, that's Michael's corn as well. The other neighbors up here is just burned completely up. And I showed Kevin and Kelly some corn last night. It was completely brown. So once again, it's a new day, but we're almost out of time. We can just do nothing, and we're very good at just doing nothing, because we've been taught this is the way to do it. And we've been taught that you need X pound in for X pound of bushels. You need so many pounds of phosphorus, and I got what you need. I'm your best friend. Because we can just do nothing because it is impossible to do it up here. You can do it in Oklahoma. You can do it here. It won't work there. I've heard it all. Or we can just do it. Nothing's impossible. This thing up here gets in our way big time. It really does. Now, you asked me about testing and, and nutrients. I used to use OSU a, a lot in, in some other labs, and I just done traditional soil tests. And I was trapped in that 
But I grew up with Rick Haney. He, he grew up about 30 miles from us, and back in our younger days, we might have drank a beer or two together. I went to a dance or two together and, and had a big time. And Rick, it really bothered him when he saw that Illinois study. And he said, we're, we're testing wrong. Because organic in is prevalent, or you couldn't raise that 50 to 150 bushel corn if it takes X amount of pounds to raise X amount of bushels. And so I started using the Haney test when he got developed. I've been down to his lab in an ARS before he retired and uh, really bought in because he has problem with traditional testing because of the chemicals that they use to extract the nutrients. Mother Nature doesn't use them chemicals. She uses what? Water. Water. And that's what Rick uses to extract it. He actually took some soil out of the archives at Fort Worth that had been in the container for 40 years. And he wet that, and guess what happened? He saw respiration from that, and the biology woke up. 40 years had been in the jug, in the jar, sealed lid. So they can hang around quite a while. So we started, we started using that. And that's the reason, and I done test. I told Rick, I said, well, you gotta prove it to me. Because I know you. He's a smart genius in what he is. And so I do side by side. I put on traditional tests, and I put some in on, and I combine, and I make the same dang thing. Maybe I'd make a little bit more over here where I put the extra in on, but it never hardly ever paid the premium that it should have. I had to borrow more money at the bank to do that, and it's just that never ending circle that you get trapped in. And so then Rick called me one day and he said, I got this new revelation. We, we take these soil tests here and we here and here, we put them in a bucket, we mix them up, we send them in. But sometimes there's a plant growing out here and it's this much taller than the rest of them. Maybe it's a cow pie, pea spot. Maybe it's a biology circle around that that's freed up the nutrients. He said, come out here and pull that plant up, shake that off and send that to me. And then pull a soil sample over here. Pull a soil sample here, pull a soil sample here, and send that to me. Unbelievable. And the PLFA in that first one was, was huge. Showing the, the microbiology was a lot. So then we knew that it was creating nutrients and water right there and feeding that plant. So he's kind of got me on that now. I think that's really good. So we do a lot of, of compost tea and humics and molasses uh, mixture with uh, dissolved urea. If I'm going to put on some urea, I'm going to dissolve it in water. And that's a little tricky because that chemical reaction will get cold and you got to have the water 85 degrees to 100 degrees and sustain it for a little bit until you get it all mixed in there and then you're good. Because for the biology, for the plant to take it up, it's got to go through the biology and it's got to get to amino acid to be readily available. I can move that urea by dissolving it to an amine, which is getting closer. It's not there. But my friends in Australia and myself and a, and a guy in California have saw we can put 16 units in on, we'll do about what, 60 in the dry form will do. And at $500 or $1,000 a ton, that's significant. So is it worth the hassle to dissolve and melt it? You better believe it. Christine Jones will tell you, you need a little bit of in sometimes to stimulate the biology. Because they, they got to have nitrogen to work and break down the carbon, the biomass. But you don't need 150 pounds or 500 pounds. So when we're putting that, that together, 
a new company, and there's two or three new companies. This is, and I'm not saying this is the company that, that you need to use. There's a company in California called Biomakers. They have been in the medical field measuring your gut bile and the biology that we have that digests the food that we just ate. And they have decided, and Lance Gunnarsson at Regen Labs, and, and actually Dr. Haney's part of that lab now, have decided that our soil can be the gut of our planet, digesting the food of the planet, which is true. And so now they're doing DNA sequencing of the biology. And there's there's several different labs. Kevin's used different labs to do that. And there's literally thousands of species. And, and a lot of them, they don't even know what to call them. They're still trying to name them. But this company, Biomakers, can tell me the number of species that's in that product that I'm putting over the top or on the seed, and what species are there and what they do. Are they nitrogen fixers? Are they digesters? Go on down the list. And so now I know what I'm putting on is that on target of what I want. Always before we threw out stuff because we needed nitrogen or phosphorus, but we didn't understand how it worked. We, and people still don't hardly believe me that nitrogen, if you put out 100 pounds of nitrogen today, how much, how much nitrogen are you going to get out of that? Say 4600. Well, in theory, 46 pounds, but in actuality, probably. In the United States, on the best day, it's 50 percent. Worldwide, we're 33 percent. And what I tell everybody, if, if you fill up a gas down here at the gas station, and you're empty, you filled her up, and it cost you 100 bucks, if you went to pull out, the gas gauge only went up to half, or a third, what would you do? They go back and buy more. <laughs> Would you just drive one out and say, You'd have to go back and buy it. Right. Would you go in and say, You sure your pumps calibrate right? No. Where are you being content, say? <laughs> and phosphorus is worse, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so, when people are griping to me, this is $1,000 for nitrogen. I said, No, it's not. It's 2000 Well, you're nuts. I said, it is, because you're only going to get half at the best. That's 3,080. <laughs> <laughs> Sticker shot. Sticker shot. So we need to, to measure the best we can. A lot of labs run the Haney test different, you know. I like the true Haney, because I, I grew up with Rick. That doesn't mean that Ward's great. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, labs all over the states and all over Canada that I only know about that probably do that. But I think we really need to see the big picture. What about for interest? Do you do PLFAs or uh, 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 the bacterial ratios and things like that? We've, we've done that all. We, we've done extensive testing. And another side of testing is If you're not going to use the data to your fullest, don't waste your money. And, and, and you can only digest so much. And so we've, we've done everything, trust me. And, and I had to pull back a little bit because I had data overload. And, and we tend to chase the rabbit down the hole because remember, I'm a recovering tillage addict. And just like an alcoholic or a chemical dependency, every once in a while, I said, dang, that feel looks pretty out there. I remember them good old days. Or I get a weed that, that I can't kill. Well, I could plow that. And so we're always tempted. Remember what he says in the book. There will be trials and 
tribulations and temptation. And it is. And so you get you get to chasing this down the hole, and it gets back to that yield thing and money thing, and you get so if you're gonna get the data and you're gonna take the soil samples, follow through, do one step at a time methodically, and as you grow, do a PLFA test and start understanding, and that's that's a soil test that shows the respiration of the biology, the, the CO2. That's how Haney knows gets that number, is you, you put some soil in the dish, put a sensor in there, and you, you close it up and you drop so many droplets of water in there and you activate, you energize that biology to come alive. And when they come alive, and he would do that in, in the same in this room. This, this morning when we got here, there was two of us in here, we could have done a CO2 respiration in here and it would have been almost nothing. It'd be some. And right now, that number would be elevated because we've been shut in here since noon. We've ate and CO2's been coming out. The more of us is in the room, not only does it build heat, CO2. So that's a good tool to measure the population to the best of our ability. If we could measure the water vapor off of them, we could get a really good number. But they haven't figured that out yet. He's got a new device now that you take a core out of the soil of about two inches and about four and a half inches down put that in there and he can measure 24-7 the respiration. And what he's found, and this is one of the things, the, the more you learn, the more you won't learn. And remember I was talking about out in the, feet, in the pit a while ago about plants taking in photosynthesis, taking in food, taking that protein, growing, and then leaking exudates out in the roots. What Haney has, has found out that that plant normally doesn't dump in Texas and Oklahoma and be different across the country, but around six to seven o'clock in the evening. See a big spike. Now, why do you think it, they do that in the evening? Full. Processing, digesting. You know, it's a little gross, but it's like us. Yeah. And so then they're gonna they're gonna leak out exudates and then they're gonna feed the biology. When they feed that biology, that that numbers just jump up. You see this huge spike. And then they feed, and they feed, and they consume the exudates, they come down, and then again about 3:30. Four o'clock in the morning, you see another dump, another leak of exudates. And so, anybody get up in the middle of the night or early in the morning? Remember how important it is to think that we're all alike. Remember that God created everyone equal. I'll give that to you. Yeah. So that's how the testing is really ramping up. So now you start you start to see the bigger picture of how all this is working and how the system is. And so if you don't have the life in there to consume the exudates, you don't have the root in there, what do you got? And that's where the high inputs come in. To replace that, we've figured out, well, we don't need them. You just need me. I'm your best friend. I've been with you 30 years. Oh, by the way, you need to put fungicide on too. Twice. <laughs> and, and, and them guys are just doing their jobs. And it's a free, it's a free country and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we just got to think how the system really works and how you can do what you did and how your neighbor can't.
Everybody asks me about ROI in, in, in Emmons Farms. And, and I've, I'm kind of a private guy. And, and I don't want to divulge a lot of that. But I'll just tell you, uh, we've been at this 12 years. Uh, I operated without a line of credit for uh, before the, the fire for about two years. Then the fire came along, and it was, it was financially, by gosh, it was hard to get over. So I had to start borrowing money back. And I kind of got myself, this 26 miles of fence, the reason I was asking about how much fence cost, I didn't knew that number, because I built a lot, uh, it was hard to digest. Ginger just paid the line of credit off the uh, day before yesterday while I was gone, and put money in, the, in savings in the bank. We've done made our land payments a year in advance, and uh, we're in a pretty good cash position. I haven't sold any calves. I still got some grain in the bin. That's kind of all I wanted to divulge because it's not, and, and I'm not bragging about that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not bragging about that. But I couldn't be doing that if I was doing it the way I done it when we got married. Still be in debt. Still be in debt. And, and I, I've been pretty dang close a few times before I figured this out. Being broke. And I just couldn't figure it out. And I tell everybody that, that my granddad and my dad done the very best they could do with the tools that they had. And when they plowed, they made them money. The fuels on the nickel a gallon are 20 cents. My dad bought the, uh, the 1958 John Deere, uh, uh, a lister, and a small disc for like $600. I, I can't even buy a lawnmower tire for $600 nowadays, almost. Uh, well, we had one on our, our combine, and it was $4,000-some dollars. What I'm saying is we have the technology and the ability to do the best we can do with what we got. That's the reason we don't need to be over here doing the way we've always done it. And if you can't understand that we've loaded our waterways and our contamination, my granddad and great granddad are mainly nitrate high in this water. I wonder where that's coming from. Chris Nichols talks about her dad. Up there, they, they've had to close the rural water system because the nitrates and phosphates where they're at. They said, daughter, please come help us. She went up there and said, well, yeah. What you need to do is you need to go cover crops. And you need to start building the soil up. And, and she went through her spill. You all have heard of Chris Nichols, I'm sure. If you hadn't, you need to. And uh, about two years, two and a half years down the road, Chris, we got a problem. We need you up here. She goes up there, like, water's not no better. And Chris said, yeah, I can see that. Well, we bought 640 acres around the water wells and they're growing cover crops. How come it's not better? We done what you said. And she said, no, you know how big the aquifer is? She said, I'm like John Wayne, as far as you can see. <laughs> you need to be growing cover crops to fix this, and you're not going to fix it tomorrow. But it's a start, and, and, and that's the progression that I try to show. We, we can't rebuild what it took 100 years to destroy in three years, or five years, or 10 years. But you got to remember, my granddad just destroyed a little, following the horse or a mule. He talked about plowing all day, and I took the plow. Ooh, that's all I've done today. And then my dad come along and bought a 25 horsepower tractor. No one had 25 mule team at home. My gosh. You, and, and then they put headlights on it. You know, nobody ever thought about putting a headlight on a horse. And so what did my dad start doing? More. 
he wound up with 180 horsepower tractor before he passed away 25 years ago. Then I come along. I'm going to have a four wheel drive. Now we got 380 horsepower tractor. You know what I do with it? Pull an air seeder. It's going to trade it off. It's going to cost me money. I need the horsepower in I need the braking power. But I destroyed more in my first 20 years of my marriage than my granddad did in his entire lifetime. And so the more we got, the bigger we got, the more destruction we done. And that's when I tell you, we don't have that long. Everybody keeps saying, well, it's tough. I was in White Cloud, Kansas. And this is how arrogant a producer was to me. I was standing in a ditch in a cornfield that I could not see the surface. I said, you might see a problem here. You don't want to fill that in and get the corn harvested. I said, aren't you worried about what was in the ditch? Nope. Topsoil here is 40 foot deep. And it is. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's in the bend of the Missouri. Huge deposit. It's unbelievable. I said, it's 40 foot deep. Well, it was. We got 20. And now, what I can do with 20 foot of topsoil? Anybody want 20 foot? Yeah. You know what he told me? <clears throat> Finish my family out. What he doesn't calculate is he's lost 20 foot from settlement to now. But he's really lost probably 12 or 15 foot of that in the last 10 years. So I don't think it's going to finish him out. He saw no problem. And it's just like, hell, I'm done. I can't help you guys. I ask producers, that I do a lot of consulting across the country, and I ask them a simple question. Do you want to try it or do you want to make it work? Answer carefully, because I'm only going to choose one of them. If I have a producer says, well, I'll try it. I don't think it'll work. You know. It, it won't work here. You, you showed us it'll work here, there, there. I'll try it. That guy, the first time he has a hiccup or failure, he's out. I told you so. The guy says, I'd like to figure this out because I don't think I can, I can't, my banker's down my rear. And uh, he says, if I don't change in the next year or two, I don't know if I can find you. That guy's all in. He'll have trials and he'll have tribulations and he'll have losses and failures. But I'm telling you, if you're doing this and I trip and I fall, which way am I falling? Forward. Forward. If I'm overwhelmed, oh, this ain't going to work. I should have never tried this. That dang Jimmy Emmons. Which way is he falling? way he's always done. You got to think about that. And they're saying, I might have a throw on but some along the lines of whether you think you'll fail or succeed, you're right. That's right. That's right. The, the positive mind, don't you try this. You probably, you probably never do this, but I'll, I'll look over there at Kevin and it's like, I know that guy. Oh, I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name, but I've seen him. You ever think of his name? You ever, just think about this. But if I look over and say, I know that guy. Just give me a minute. I'll think of his name. Saul. Yeah, we had that conversation yesterday on the way up here. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. The mind's a powerful thing. 
it'll do what you tell it. If you tell it, I can't think of Kevin's name, lo and behold, you won't. So as a mental step, this has nothing to do with soil health. Quit telling yourself that. The same way in soil health, quit telling yourself this won't work. This is bigger than all of us. And, and, and just remember, I'm not as smart as all of us can be. Listen to that just a little bit. My success was not my intelligence in figuring this out. My success was surrounding myself with everybody else and collectively we put our minds together and we figure this out. And that's what you're doing. You're having some help Lots coming help. in. And the more you get, the easier it is. Michael Jordan was probably one of the best basketball players I've ever saw in my entire life play. But how good would he have been if no one was hit out bounds to throw the ball to him? Or as he's running down there, throw it down there and let him slam dunk it. He got all the credit, but what? He'll tell you, if they hadn't fed me the ball, I couldn't have scored 60 points. So once again, you're right. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And sadly, the majority of the population don't think we can. They think this is a fad. Cindy said, Ginger, thank you for allowing Jimmy to come do this. It's powerful what we can do together. And that's the reason, you know, I'm not doing this for the money. Yeah, I charge to come and do this. But you think, well, I'm going to get rich and retire off of what I charge. No. I have to have to pay myself a little bit to pay Carson and, and my absence be gone. But I'm doing this to help you guys out. To, to, to try to share the success of what we can do and try to give you the tools to be successful yourselves. The, the entire planet is in trouble. Whether we're causing global warming or not, don't enter that debate. Is this naturally occurring or is it man-made? Don't enter that debate because the weather and markets are two things that we can't control, like I said earlier. What we control is management over our domain and our land. We can do the right thing or the wrong thing. The, the bottom line is we are warmer than we were. The warmer we get, the more water is held in the atmosphere. The more water that's held in the atmosphere is the real issue. 
because when we had the energy, we had these huge, huge storms. And it's whiplash. It's flash drought, flash flood, huge snowstorms like they had in California in the drought, and then nothing. So don't fall in the wagon of debating who's at fault. That's what we want to do. That pie wasn't that good, Kelly. It's all your fault. <laughs> You know, I feel so much better. <coughs> just don't, just don't fall in that. Let's do the right thing. Figure this out. Let's pay, let's pay the bank. Put some CDs in the bank. Put some savings in the bank because we'll need it one day. Because it won't rain. If we have a big rain event like Jeremy's has, let's don't run it down to wherever your water goes here. Let's, let's don't let our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren have to buy a bottle of water to survive. Try to help your neighbors understand what you're doing. As we was talking yesterday, I've, I've got neighbors that I catch in my field. I come over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you don't see me. They're worse than a deer. <laughs> and the first few times, I'd stop. I'd walk in like, what's going on? Oh, nothing. See if you got a rain here. And I kind of embarrassed them, and, and I felt bad. And so now I just drive on by, just like I do a deer. Like, he didn't see me. They're trying to learn. And you know, I've had a few of them that has finally come to me and said, well, I guess you're going to have to share with me because I can't figure out what the world you're doing. I think the weeds look a little bad. I see you got a new pickup. How'd you do that? I wouldn't go. So, be neighborly if they ask. Try to share with them. Try to help them understand. That's what y'all do. I hope. Part of the research. It, it's so nice to.